The New Tech Times, a video magazine for the electronic age. In this edition, audio bionics help the deaf talk to the outside world. Also, cruise in California style with microchip car stereos. Later, a look at high-tech growing pains in Austin, and cable goes retail at the mall. All this and more in this edition of the New Tech Times. The New Tech Times is brought to you through a grant from Wausau Insurance Companies. Times change. Wausau works. And by the collective voice of the consumer electronics industry, CEG, the Consumer Electronics Group, Electronic Industries Association. Hello, I'm Nicholas Johnson. Welcome to this edition of the New Tech Times. This week we look at some new and exciting applications for the microchip. And we begin with a report on miniaturized communication. The silicon chip has made everything from calculators to radios small enough to carry around in our pockets. And now it's been used to help improve communications for the hearing impaired. Now deaf people have communicated via the telephone for years using large teletype-like machines. The problem was that this equipment is expensive, it's stationary, and limited in scope. But now a Minneapolis man has combined computer knowledge, microchip technology, and love for his hearing impaired daughter, and come up with a new portable comprehensive communicator for the deaf. Here's our report, produced by Brent Johnson. Speech. Most of us take it for granted. But for the deaf and hearing impaired, speech is an unopened door to the outside world. Now there is a microprocessor designed specifically for the deaf to help bridge their communications gap. It's called the personal communicator. This 18 ounce handheld computer terminal has a fold out modem, is compatible with either old fashioned telecommunications devices for the deaf, TDDs they are called, or standard digital computers. The personal communicator, PC for short, is the brainchild of Fernando Garcia. When his daughter Deborah was six months old, he discovered that she was deaf. Deborah is now 25. In the family, uh, Deborah uh, had no problem because you learn how to understand each other, even without a formal language. Uh, you kind of read each other's minds, uh, what, what you need and what you don't need. The problem for Deborah and all deaf people is when they are out in the hearing world, it's an intimidating land of silence and confusion. The impact of their handicap affects every aspect of their lives. If you cannot communicate well, then you have an education problem. If you have an education problem, then you have uh, employment problems, self-supporting. Uh, so I started looking into each phase of her life. Uh, uh, the problems uh, of communications and what was available technically. Bernardo didn't find much. The new technology he was seeing as a computer salesman hadn't penetrated the deaf market at all. Very little development was being done on behalf of the deaf. It's a small market of consumers who in many fundamental ways could benefit from new technology the most. When Fernando was laid off in 1980, he decided to devote all of his time to starting his own high-tech company to develop products for the deaf. A lot of people get conceptual ideas, but to get it to work, uh, usually you're not qualified. It just it requires somebody, a team of people to work. I took the basic idea that Fred had for a pocketable, portable communications tool and brought it to reality instead of just an idea in somebody's mind. It took John Montague and a team of designers two years to develop and produce the first personal communicator. The PC has as much computing power as a typical home computer, and with its own modem you can talk using synthesized speech or in writing to either computers or TDDs. It also has a word processor built into it, a repertory dialer, an alarm, and a scientific calculator. It sells for $1,300. It's Deborah and Pam Nigren's job to find buyers in the deaf community using TDDs or by signing. Well, really, this is really exciting because there's nothing before. All the TDDs are old-fashioned, old 
electronics technology. They're big, they're clunky, but this one is small, it's nice. It'll be a lot of help for um, deaf people because it has many benefits. You can call by voice to a hearing person. Um, you can call to work and to inform your boss that you're sick and you don't need two devices, you can just use one. Before I had to really depend and rely on, I became really frustrated because I had to depend on people. And now I have a personal communicator, it helps me a lot. Um, I can do many things by myself, I can do anything. I can do things in different ways. A deaf person with a personal communicator doesn't feel, well they feel, or they wouldn't feel inhibited to enter new situations if they knew they could communicate. Traditionally, large high-tech companies have avoided developing products for highly specialized markets like the deaf. But because the PC is basically a handheld terminal with data entry capability, its potential applications in business markets broadens Audiobionic's sales base. Production is done by hand at this point, and everybody helps. They can make 600 systems a month, and with minimal automated equipment, they should be able to turn out 2,500 units per month. Emergency. Fire. Ambulance. Doctor. The future for Audiobionics and their first product looks promising. Its impact on the lives of the deaf should prove significant in a practical sense and as a symbol of new technology's entry into the handicap market. A beginning for Fernando's dream of the future. Doctor. That's a touching story. Fernando Garcia's daughter and other hearing impaired people now have the chance to communicate more fully with the rest of us thanks to microchips. The price might be a stumbling block for some, but if business buys this device and uses it for other purposes as well, well then the price may come down for those who really need it to communicate. It's interesting that microchips, which provide necessities for some, can provide luxuries for others. Take the radio in your car, for instance. Now, most of us used to be happy to have an AM radio to listen to on the highway. Then came FM, FM stereo, tape players. Now, auto audio, is high-tech and high-priced, if you can afford it at all. Here's our report, produced by Tom Tomaszewski. You can call this picture Spring Over the Superhighway. It's a California classic, laced with concrete ribbon that knots endlessly with automobiles. The newest dream in the land of America's dream. something that uh, is very flat. For Pierre Mayhew, standard FM stereo has gone the way of fuzzy dice and the rear view mirror. It's out of style. He's a former RCA record executive. He knows his business. Volume control is his three-store outfit. They cater to the high-tech, top-dollar trade. Hi. Hi. I'm looking for a car stereo for my car. Good. What kind of car do you have? Uh, 240 diesel. Mm -hmm. What year is 81. Did you have anything in mind? The fact of the matter is your location, where you all are doing business, is an important part of this. Why so? Well, the people in Southern California are probably um, more aggressive, more advanced, uh, make more money. They enjoy the better things in life, and, and um, we try to supply them with one being, of course, sound systems. That was a $3,000 blast of sound that belongs to I Todd do. Cheney. It's crazy. To spend $3,000 on a system is definitely crazy. But it is, it, I have definitely had very good enjoyment out of it, amazed many people. He's 22, says his purchase was almost impulse. He's been a high-fidelity fiend for years, was interested in a powerful but well-camouflaged system, audio goal, designed as stock equipment. And beneath that, I have a 6x9 BCPI woofer. 
You've got to dress this stuff down. They're a hot item in the five-finger discount market. They get pilfered a bunch. One high priest of high fidelity here is Al Orozco. His is a finite world of problems with endless variations on one solution. The biggest problem had been that cars have 12-volt batteries instead of standard home electrical power. Home quality, studio quality sound, required home-style power. The solution was microchip technology. It made the development of small, powerful amps possible. Then I have one separate amplifier driving this speaker, another separate amplifier driving this speaker. And made single amp audio systems like this one, as obsolete as the Model A this replica mimics. The $1,300 single amp system in this car is the simplest of the sophisticated systems that volume control has been installing for the past two years. Take this 1984 Corvette, for example. It has a $5,000 system, 13 speakers, four amplifiers packed inside. Santa Monica's volume control's owner says that high-end auto audio accounts for 60% of his business, a business that is a combination of high-tech equipment and street machine smarts, expensive audio hot rodding. I give him entertainment with the type of systems I put in cars. It's an entertainment business. They thank you, send you letters. They thank you, they have so much uh, fun in their cars. Another California classic. If you have story ideas, suggestions, or comments about the New Tech Times, get in touch with us electronically through the source. Log on with Public 125 Direct. On CompuServe, use Go NTT. Or contact us directly through the New Tech Times electronic bulletin board by dialing 608-263-2784. When I cruise down those Iowa highways, it's with a pocket radio and some of my amateur radio gear. But those Californians spend a lot more time on the road, so it's only natural they'd spend more money on their highway entertainment. Microchips have done wonders for us in a wide range of applications. They come from manufacturing plants in places like California's Silicon Valley. But as more chips are needed, more plants spring up. And those chip factories are now moving into the Sun Belt, to places like Austin, Texas. Austin is growing in status as the country's newest Silicon Valley, thanks to the efforts of retired Navy Admiral Bobby Inman. But there's some Central Texans who aren't so happy with what Inman's dreams have done to the countryside. Here's Gary Probst's report. This is Central Texas, the scenic hill country that was home to LBJ. At the edge of this rugged land is Austin, one of the more beautiful cities in America. The capital of Texas is known for its clean environment and its quality of life. But Austin is becoming known for more than its beauty. It's expanding at a rapid pace. Cedar trees are being cleared from the hillsides to make room for homes and condos. There's a reason for all this development. Austin is on the way to becoming the nation's new center of high technology. Well, economically, it means a vibrancy and a, and a growth that makes us the envy of many communities throughout the nation. Howard Falkenberg has been helping the governor to lure high-tech business to Central Texas. We have here in Austin, as throughout the Sun Belt, a growth of economic opportunity for people that we hope will carry us for the next several decades. Those opportunities involve the production of computers, along with technology for NASA and the Defense Department. Austin's promoters are having a great deal of success. This is construction of a new plant for the Lockheed Corporation. Parts for the space shuttle will soon be manufactured here. 3M is moving some of its operation from the cold of Minneapolis to this land on the outskirts of Austin. Research and development labs will soon cover 200 acres. Motorola is also expanding. The company will use this new building for research. 
There are thousands of austenites already employed by the company. Plates of advanced microchips are mass produced. Large computer firms like IBM and Texas Instruments are also part of the economic scene. Proponents of high tech believe it's just the beginning. There's an optimism that exists in Austin. Uh, people feel they're in a better position than they were a year ago, and they expect a year from now to be in a better position than they are today. There's a reason for optimism. His name is Admiral Bobby Inman. He moved to Austin to lead a consortium of 14 electronics companies. They're combining research efforts to develop the next generation of computer chips, which may allow computers to think like human beings. The name of the company is the Microelectronics and Computer Technology Corporation, or MCC. What MCC brings to Austin is a new brain cell that will spew out ideas uh, that will hopefully result in some of the best computer designs in the country 10 years out. When the corporations that are involved turn to manufacturing products based on the technology we create, uh, the odds are fairly high. They'll look for uh, creating new facilities. And there's where the large job creation comes. But there have been some problems caused by Inman's presence in Austin. Real estate developers are speculating that Inman's company will greatly accelerate growth. Land prices jump to $30,000 per acre, miles outside of the city. There's talk that this community of under 400,000 could reach a population of more than one million before the turn of the century. Inman believes it is possible. We're at the edge of an explosion in the whole information handling industry. Uh, all the way from the chips that create the computers to the networking and the communications and distributed databases, the whole way we go about doing our job. Uh, it's the fastest growing sector of the economy worldwide. Uh, it was on the order of 325 billion worldwide in 81. A uh, projection of uh, figures on the order of a trillion dollars annual revenues in 1990, I think, are very reasonable. But some people are not in favor of the high-tech boom. Environmentalists worry that the rapid expansion could destroy the quality of life, which is attracting so many of the high-tech firms. Just the traffic is the biggest thing you notice as far as growth. Uh, you, notice, uh, you know, it just takes you five minutes longer to get somewhere than it did six months ago, and there's just more cars on the road. You know, I think if I'd grown up in this town, I'd really resent what's going on. Rapid development is already taking its toll on Austin's environment. This is Barton Creek, a spring-fed swimming pool near downtown Austin. For decades, people have escaped the heat of a Texas summer by jumping into the cool, pure water. It comes from the aquifer, an underground lake which takes care of Austin's drinking needs. But last summer, Barton Creek had to be closed to the public. Bacteria from inadequate sewage treatment found its way into the aquifer. People like environmentalist Frank Cooksey believe it's an early warning that something has to be done. Well, it's basically because the pollutants are built up in the areas that are being rapidly developed and occupied at very high densities. And uh, you get a lot of buildup of uh, fecal coliforms, of nitrates, phosphorus, and other uh, types of pollution that uh, creep into the aquifer that feeds this spring. Cooksey wants city government to slow down the expansion or impose more stringent controls. He and Councilwoman Sally Shipman are concerned about more dangerous forms of pollution. You know, all of my uh, understanding is that high technologies do generate a, a high level of, of toxic waste. It may be a small amount, but it's highly toxic, and this is one of the uh, problems that they've had in Silicon Valley. How do you deal with toxic waste, hazardous waste? Um, we are, you know, again, uh, rapidly working on a hazardous waste ordinance and a hazardous waste transportation ordinance. Concern about pollution and urban sprawl has Austin taking a second look at the type of high-tech industry moving into the city. Strict environmental laws may prevent the kinds of problems experienced by many older industrial communities. The quality of life must have been great at some point in time, and, and what attracted industry there in the first place. If we go on, the, on a cycle and start to deteriorate and lose our quality of life, then there's a chance that industry will relocate to, to the next place. Uh, and that, that is the challenge we face. As a student at the University of Texas, I remember a dip or two in Barton Springs. 
It was refreshing on a hot summer's day. But the advent of microchips can bring more to our communities than new jobs and new tax dollars. And we might want to look more closely at how our demands for products affect the delicate balance of nature. Demand for cable television in many cities has created waiting lists for installation or even to sign up for those new channel offerings. But in Denver, one company is working to make shopping for cable as easy as buying a shirt. Here's our report, produced by Dale Neitzel. HBO, Showtime, local channels, community access, 24-hour news, sports, Disney, Nickelodeon, Playboy. The choices offered by cable television seem to go on and on, and that can be confusing, particularly when you decide to get cable installed at home. Now, someone's working to help you make those choices easier, almost like buying new clothes at the local mall. The basic concept behind Connecting Point is to sell cable television services in a retail environment. Joseph Terrell is president of American Cable Connection, the parent company of the Connecting Point. Uh -huh, that's the Disney Channel. Uh, the, Disney Channel. the greatest assist to selling uh, cable services in this type of environment is to be able to actually see it demonstrated and to see it actually uh, illustrated in such a way that the customer gains a better understanding of what they're purchasing. If you were to describe in words, for example, what uh, Disney is all about or what ESPN or HBO or some of these other services uh, try to give a visual impression of what they're about, you might, be do that, you might be able to do that in a limited way. But when you're able to demonstrate it with an actual uh, TV monitor and to see it actually in, in use and get an idea of the kind of programming that these uh, channels provide, then you're going to get a a better understanding of what cable is all about and you can make a more intelligent choice of the kind of cable services you want in your home. The Connecting Point's lure is that the stores offer more than cable services. Each store carries a complete line of telephones, computers, and video equipment. Sort of a one-stop shopping mart for personal electronics. But it's the approach to cable TV marketing that's unique. Store manager Michael Weiss explains. Yeah, you know, one of the exciting shows that cable offers today is MTV. As an example, we're selling things like the MTV Premium Jacket, probably one of the hottest items in the market today. And we sell ESPN uh, sport bags and visors and shorts, coffee mugs from all the cable channels. The exchange of converters can happen now at a retail location rather than having to wait home for hours on end for the cable company to come out to exchange the converter. And that just adds that, that feeling of goodwill between the cable company and the consumer, the ability to walk in, get their, their converter exchanged to the most up-to-date equipment without having to wait at home. If you're baffled by the number of choices available in cable and a phone call to your local cable company doesn't seem to help, take heart. Retail cable might be an answer coming your way in the future. Microchips have changed things for all of us in these new tech times. They've spurred the development of pocket radios and calculators, brought computers into our homes, and as we've seen this week, allowed us to make strides in communication with the hearing impaired and entertainment systems for our cars. They've given us many choices to make as we learn more about the implications of their production and use. It's been an interesting time observing the people, places, and things touched by the microchip. But we've come to the end of our first season on PBS. In the months ahead, as we prepare to bring you a fresh series of programs in the fall, we'll let those of you who are regulars see your favorite programs again. If you're joining us for the first time, it's an opportunity to see most of our first season from now until October. But before we depart this week, we thought you'd like to hear what some of our viewers had to say about the New Tech Times this season. Thousands of you have been in touch with us by mail and electronically since we began our adventure together. Patricia Paglia of Aurora, Colorado wrote, as one who is somewhat baffled, confused, and even frightened by a lot of the new technology, I find the show displays and explains many aspects of the information explosion in a simple, straightforward, and entertaining manner. A neighboring New Tech Times viewer from Denver like the humor our regular commentator Peter McWilliams brought to the program. What a mind blower your 228 New Tech Times was. McWilliams' kidding was delightful and high time for such. Not all of our viewers were as pleased. Here's a sample of their remarks. 
I cannot tell you how much I hated the Fuzzbuster segment on your show. PBS is supposed to be smart. How dare you make such a device seem acceptable? Signed, Robert L. Lee of Wheeling, West Virginia. Another viewer wanted more technical information. A lot of your show seems a bit gee whiz to me. How about a little more emphasis on education and a little less on entertainment? Maybe you could slide some technical specs through on graphics, not audio, and most people would never know the difference. Signed, Russ, WA4ZZU, Nashville, Tennessee. Finally, a Chicago area viewer wrote us this letter, proving magazines aren't always what they seem. I'm interested in subscribing to your magazine, New Tech Times. Any information concerning price and number of issues per year would be greatly appreciated. Signed, Jim Vionsky, Waukegan, Illinois. Jim, you can get each issue of the New Tech Times on Channel 11 in Chicago. Check your local listings. And that holds true for the rest of our audience as well. The New Tech Times is now broadcast on more than 240 public television stations around the U.S. But times and channels vary, so do check your local listings. As we prepare for the new fall season, we'll try to work in as many of our viewers' suggestions and story ideas as we can. We hope to hear from more of you in the coming months. For the New Tech Times staff, I'm Nicholas Johnson. Tech Times has been brought to you through a grant from Wausau Insurance Companies. Times change. Wausau works. And by the collective voice of the consumer electronics industry, the CEG, the Consumer Electronics Group, Electronic Industries Association. For a transcript of this program, send $3 to program number 128, the New Tech Times, 821 University Avenue, Madison, Wisconsin, 53706. Or you can now communicate electronically with the New Tech Times. Just call the source or CompuServe and select the New Tech Times online.